Okay. Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Rob Gentile. Did I say it right? Yes. Okay. And you've had um, two near death experiences during um, after a heart attack and while you're getting your transplant, I think, right? Yes, right. And um, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna let you go ahead and um, tell your story. Okay, thank you. First of all, Peggy, thank you so much for having me today. I'm delighted to be here and share my story with you. Uh, I'm so humbled by the fact that it took me three years to write my book. My book was launched in February of last year, Quarks of Light, a near-death experience. And it became a number one bestseller actually in 13 categories. So uh, for all of you who have supported the book out there, thank you so much. Uh, I am just so grateful for that. So let me start with my experience. Um, I live now in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, I have for about the past 20 years. And what happened to me was a very fluke kind of an experience. Back on uh, the night that I'll never forget, January 26, 2016, I uh, had a massive heart attack. And let me preface the story by saying that uh, four days prior to my massive heart attack, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I had gone to Pittsburgh to have some bone spurs removed from my neck. There's a world famous Korean doctor at UPMC in Pittsburgh that removes bone spurs. Um, and he has, a, he has a special way of doing that instead of cutting the back of your neck open and fusing your vertebrae and you're in pain the rest of your life. He goes in through the front of the neck, makes a small cut here, moves the esophagus aside, and he goes in and drills out these spurs. So it's a, it's a very simple uh, operation. You only spend one night in the hospital. Well, what happened to me was, unfortunately, um, four nights later in my bed, uh, we now know that I threw a blood clot and that blood clot went straight into my widow maker. So at 11 p.m., um, my wife, uh, I started screaming in pain. My wife had no idea what was happening because I have one child, my daughter, Maria, who has Rett syndrome, very rare. She's a special needs child, nonverbal. She has a seizure disorder. And my wife thought it was my daughter uh, screaming in pain. So she's running around trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and here it was me in our own bed screaming. So I had passed out from the pain. I'm completely unconscious. My wife dials 911. They rush me to the hospital. And thank goodness the hospital is only three miles from my house here in North Carolina. Uh, they get me into the hospital, Peggy, and they knew I was having a massive heart attack. They gave me some blood thinners. They gave me some things to kind of stabilize me. And what happened next was quite interesting because once they got me stable, uh, the cardiologist was not in the hospital. They called the cardiologist to come in and there was a nurse in the room with my wife and I'm laying on the gurney, um, passed out. And all of a sudden, in what my wife said was kind of like a scene from the movie, The Exorcist, I sprang forward on the gurney straight up from my waist up as if somebody had grabbed me by my lapels and just pulled me forward with great force. And I sat up on the gurney and my eyes popped wide open and I screamed out the name Frosty. When I screamed out the name Frosty, I fell backwards on the gurney and I flatlined. Code blue rang out through the hospital and in rushed a team of doctors that started to try to resuscitate me. Now, what's interesting about this is that uh, Dr. Patel, uh, a beautiful little Indian woman who rushed in to start the resuscitation before they took my wife out of the room, my, my wife said to her, please, you have to save him. We have a special needs child and uh, she will not make it without him. And I cannot do this alone. And they took my wife into the waiting room right outside the, the hospital room. My wife dropped to her knees and began praying out loud to God to save me. Now they began to work on me. And for 20 minutes, I was dead. They could not resuscitate me. My medical records are very clear about this. I did a lot of research for the book. I interviewed all the doctors. They did uh, paddle shocks, vigorous sternal rub. They did uh, four times. They injected um, in my heart 
uh, I forget the name of the medicine right now, to try to, to re revive the heart. And uh, they could not revive me. Finally, the, um, the, the cardiologist showed up 20 minutes later. He did an emergency catheterization up through my leg, found the blockage in the Widowmaker, inserted two stints, uh, but it was too late. I had gone into cardiogenic shock and they had to intubate me. So I'm on the vent and I drifted into a four day coma. So that's how um, my whole experience began. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of a backstory on this because what was interesting about it is that um, Frosty was the nickname for my brother in law. And unfortunately, seven weeks before I died that night, my brother in law, Frosty, had uh, died by suicide. And Frosty uh, lives, he was living with his parents at the time, which is about 35 miles uh, from, from us here. And he was living in the upstairs bedroom, going through a divorce. Uh, Frosty, unfortunately, had uh, a drug addiction, but he had been clean for years, and he was on medication to keep him off of those drugs. But it was, you know, around that Christmas time season, he was worried about paying for his daughter's college education. A lot of pressure went out one night to try to blow off some steam, and unfortunately, got a hold of a very, very nasty street drug. Uh, called Flaca that makes you go insane for like 20 minutes. So unfortunately, Frosty had um, committed suicide that night. His mother called me around five in the morning and asked me to come down to the house to go up into the bedroom and sift through a, a rather gruesome scene to try to find a journal or a note or something that Frosty had left um, that would explain why he did that. So what happened was, is that in that time when I was dead on the gurney, Frosty came to me. And it's kind of interesting because you never know how these things happen. I don't know if Frosty came to me um, you know, immediately when I flatlined or during that period when they were trying to resuscitate me, but it's very odd that, and this is in my medical records, that you know I came up off the gurney, screamed his name before I flatlined. And, uh, and then collapsed. So whenever Frosty came to me, it was kind of interesting because uh, Frosty came and he told me this. He said, I've made a big mess out of things and you have to go back and help clean things up. But tell my parents I'm in a good place. Now, what's curious about this, Peggy, is that I was raised Catholic and if someone uh, back in the day when I was raised, you know, the Catholic rules were that if someone took their own life, that they were, uh, that was a mortal sin, they were condemned to hell, no pass, no go. And that was the first thing that really struck me that Frosty told me he was in a good place. So obviously, he was not uh, in hell. And I had always wondered, you know, someone, particularly someone who is not of their right mind, is on drugs or whatever the situation is. You know, how could a loving God condemn someone to hell for such a complex, you know, misunderstood act as suicide, such a tragic thing? Yeah. Uh, so what happened was, is that um, as I was uh, coming out of my four day coma and during that period, I have to tell you that they were sending in neurologists to see if I were brain dead. Now, I don't know how they test someone to see if you're brain dead, but during that four day period, um, they, they sent in several neurologists to see if I was brain dead. They really didn't know. My brother, my oldest brother, Lou, drove down from Pittsburgh and he called uh, the local parish priest here. And the local parish priest came in, uh, uh, anointed me with oil, gave me the last, the last rites. And in the Catholic faith, it's called, uh, the Catholic faith is called extreme unction, which a Catholic only gets one time in their life uh, to prepare their soul to face, to face uh, God. So I got, I got my last rites, the extreme unction. And then on the fourth day, my doctor called my family together and said, look, we can't wait any longer. We're going to take out the vent. And uh, if he breathes on his own, then we'll see what we have, probably a vegetable, but we can't wait any longer. So obviously they took the vent out. I started choking um, and, and I came out of it, but my, my heart was completely destroyed. So they had me on life support 
And what's interesting is, is that when I came out of coma, um, besides uh, Dr. Bajwa, who is the first person I saw when I came out of coma, he, he was the, the cardiologist that put the stents in and he's a Sikh. So he had the turban on. And I tell a funny story about that in the book. But my wife approached the bed and she said to me, you know, I was like a child. And all I kept saying was, it was frosty. It was frosty. Your brother frosty came to me. You have to believe me. And she said, honey, I believe you because that's the first thing that I thought of before you died. You, you came forward on the gurney, you screamed out his name and you collapsed. So she said, I believe you don't, don't worry about it. And she said, tell me exactly what frosty said to you. And I told her what he said to me that, uh, I made a big mess out of things. You have to go back and help clean things up, but tell my parents I'm in a good place. And my wife said, oh my God, that's my brother. He was always making a big mess of things and he was not one to ask for help. So um, it was curious because that was my first experience, my first near-death experience. And you know, as time went on, I began to realize that it was Frosty that was preparing me for an even deeper near-death experience while I was in Chicago waiting for my heart. But before I get there, I have to tell you the second part of the story because it's just, just incredible. So on the second day coming out of my coma, Dr. Patel, who is a, a very close friend of mine now, a beautiful little Indian woman, the doctor that refused to give up on me that night, um, she came to my bedside and she sat down beside me and my arms were paralyzed. I couldn't move my hands. Uh, and she came and she sat down and she put her hand on mine and she began to tell me how happy she was to see me alive. And, and she started to tell me all the things she did to try to save me that night. She became very emotional. We both started to cry. And then she said, it got very personal. And then she said to me, she said, you know, Rob, um, Six months before my first child was born, my first boy, she said, uh, my father and I were always very, very close in our life to the point where we can, we can read each other's thoughts. And all he was waiting for was to see this child's face and to see my son born. And she said, unfortunately, six months before my child was born, he died suddenly of a brain aneurysm. And she said, you know, I've been bitter about that. I've lost my faith. And, but she said, seeing you here today alive and everything that we went through, because there's no way you could have lived. She said, it, it gives me hope that maybe, maybe there is something out there. And That's all awesome. of a sudden, you know, it, it clicked. While Dr. Patel was working on me, a male spirit had entered the room. And I kept on hearing over and over again, keep working on him. Don't give up. You can save him. Keep working on him. You can save him. And it, it struck me in that moment that it was Dr. Patel's father that had come to her and was spiritually pushing her not to give up on me. And when I told her that story, of course, you know, she burst into tears and, and it was him trying to tell her that he's really never left her and he's always been with her. And that story, you know, gave her uh, so much hope. And now uh, every time, you know, every year that it's his birthday, because this has been almost six years now, we always talk about how her father came to her that night, uh, prompting her to, uh, you know, to keep working on me and save me. Incredible. That's awesome. That you had two people on the other side, at least that you know of that were saying he's got to be here. Yes, two people on the other side. Uh, my, you know, my beautiful brother-in-law, Frosty, the most peaceful, you know, outdoorsman, the most peaceful, uh, beautiful human being you'd ever want to meet, who was, you know, tormented in this life with anxiety, with drug addiction. But I, I had a sense that when he passed over, none of those things, he took none of those things with him. He was at peace. I sensed a deep sense of regret uh, because, you know, it, it, the collateral damage that takes place with the loved ones that you leave behind when you take your own life is just really tragic. I, it's deeply affected his parents. They've aged. 
terribly over the last years, rapidly. His, uh, his only daughter that he left behind has been very, very difficult on her. So I sensed a lot of regret with Frosty, um, but it was so comforting to see him at peace and, and in a good place. So that was, uh, that was my first near-death experience. So what happened from there, Peggy, is that when I woke up, they told me my heart was destroyed. Um, I, and I call this chapter in the book, Seeking a New Heart, because I went everywhere here. I went to Duke. I went to Sanger Heart Clinic. Um, I went everywhere to try to get a heart, and I could not get a heart. So, of course, this was, I'm 56 years old, can't get a heart, um, and I don't know what to do. Uh, they've got me on two things. It was kind of interesting. I was in this defibrillator vest, which every time my heart went out, which was often, this thing would shock me back to life. Talk about PTSD. Ah. And then uh, they, also, they also put a, a port in my chest, dripping a medicine called milrinone on my heart every 60 seconds. This pump would, you know, this whirring sound would drip medicine on my heart. And the doctor said, I want you to think of this uh, as like STP for the heart, uh, because it, it makes the heart pump faster, but it also, it starts the clock ticking. So this time bomb is going off. So I have, I have this vest on, I have a battery pack on, you know, slung over this side of my shoulder. I have, I have a battery pack slung over the other side of my shoulder with this pump, you know, dripping into my heart, this medicine. So the clock is ticking and uh, no one will give me a heart. So because of your like, age, what's that? Was it because of your age that you had trouble getting a heart? Well, it's, it was mostly because um, hearts are in short supply. And they're still in short supply it, it, because they're, they're, number one, there, there aren't enough donors. Number two, you know, the heart to get a heart, to, it has to fit the, the right size has to fit into your pericardium. Um, and unfortunately, because of drugs, alcohol, smoking, all the things that are going on in our society now, um, it's very, very difficult to find a good heart to put in someone. I didn't there know are, there were different sizes. There are different sizes. Yes. Okay. And interestingly, you, you, you'll like this, uh, which I found uh, fascinating, is that anatomically, men and women are identical, except women's hearts are significantly smaller. So huh. you can get, a man can get a woman's heart, and I won't spoil anything from the book, but um, it, it, you know they have found over the years that a smaller heart, particularly if you take care of yourself after transplant, a smaller heart will grow inside this sac, which is called the pericardium. Uh, so in, in years and years ago, when they first started, uh, heart transplant has been going on, on now for 50 years. So for the first couple of decades, it was even worse because they, they tried to size the heart perfectly to go into the donor, um, or the, the donor heart into the recipient. But they learned over the years through trial and error because there weren't enough hearts that if they put a smaller heart inside someone uh, and, they, and, and you take care of it, it'll grow. Um, so- Ah, huh, go to fit? Uh, what's that? It'll grow to fit? It'll grow to fit, yeah. Ah, it's interesting. It'll grow to fit. Um, so this is where my story kind of gets kind of interesting because I work for, uh, I'm a sales engineer for a steel company. I work for a privately held company in Chicago. And when my boss, I told my boss that I wasn't coming back to work. I, I you know, had to get a heart transplant. Didn't look like I was going to live because I couldn't get a heart anywhere. He said, well, let me talk to the owner of the company before you resign. And I didn't know that the owner of, of my company is a philanthropist. He donates a lot of money to the University of Chicago Medicine and he made a phone call and uh, lo and behold, he called me up and he said, Rob, I want you to come to the University of Chicago Medicine and I want you to talk to this doctor. And the doctor called me and he said, I promise you that if you come here, I'll transplant you within four months. So before I knew it, Peggy, lo and behold, um, it was in April. Actually, it was kind of interesting. I got admitted to the University of Chicago on April 20th, which was the day my father died when I was five years old. So it was kind of like a little nudge that he was with me. You had a lot of divine intervention. 
divine, a lot of divine intervention through my journey. So I was admitted to um, the University of Chicago and there was a, um, an incredible, who's also all the doctors are friends of mine now because I had to interview them for the book. But uh, Dr. Juvenandan, a, an Indian man, who was a, a world famous transplant surgeon. When I got there, he said, Rob, I, here's the thing. The trick now is keeping you alive because even with the, you know, the defibrillator device, the milrinone dripping on your heart, your heart is ready to give out at any time. So he said, ironically, I've been working on this um, new, uh, new heart pump. It's called the New Pulse. And he said, it's uh, about the size of a lunchbox. And this new technology, he said, well, I'll, I'll put a slit right above your breast. I'll put a little balloon pump down through your aorta and out, out the left side of your body, uh, behind your rib cage, there'll be a titanium disc run by an iPad and the, the wires will come out of your body attached to this pump and it'll keep you alive until a donor heart arrives because we don't know when, it's gonna, when one is going to arrive. And I said, wow, that's really cool, doc. I said, uh, so how many people have uh, you used this device on? <laughs> And he said, uh, well, that's just it. He said, we've only tested this thing on cows and pigs. Um, he said, but to be honest with you, it's really your only shot. So I talked to my wife about it and I signed the documents and I moved forward with the clinical trial, made history with the new pulse. And now the new pulse is being implanted in people all across the country as a bridge uh, to transplant while they wait for a donor heart. And the wonderful thing is, is they can actually wait at home instead of living in the hospital like I did uh, for, for their heart. So it's awesome. pretty, pretty incredible. So Peggy, my, my, um, but even with the heart pump and everything that was going on with me, um, unfortunately, right before my donor heart arrived, uh, my heart gave out again. And this is where I had my most profound near-death experience. And this is what the, the, the book title, Quarks of Light, uh, a near-death experience is based on. And what happened was, like I said, I don't wanna to spoil too much for, the, for those who choose to purchase the book on Amazon and read it, but what happened to me that night was so extraordinary. I had a dark night of the soul. I was in my room and this storm, I was on the eighth floor of the hospital and the hospital was facing Lake Michigan. So way up on the, on the eighth floor, all of a sudden out of nowhere at night, this storm breaks out. And it was the most violent storm I had ever seen in my life. These sheets of rain were slamming up against the window and you know all this lightning in the sky, it was, it was insane. And what happened was, is that almost as if the dark one began to bait me um, all of this junk, all these mistakes that I made in my life, all of these memories, these terrible things started to come up and kind of haunt me to weaken my spirit. And before the storm subsided, it was then that my heart started getting weak. I had gone into tachycardia and I just resigned myself. I resigned my spirit and I said, I, I just, I can't, and there were other medical things going on that I don't want to get into. And I just resigned myself and I said, do with me what you will. And I just let my spirit go. And in that moment, I was taken up into this timeless place. And, you know, it took me three years to write the book. It took me three years because this chapter entitled Into the Ethereal was the most difficult, it's the shortest chapter in the book because there's no language for these experiences, as you know, but it was the dip, most difficult and longest chapter to write. So what happened was, is that when I just resigned my spirit, I found myself standing in the middle of nowhere. And the best, the best way to describe this is, is that it's kind of like looking, um, outside an airplane window when you're flying on a, on a, on a clear day. You can see everything, but, you can, you, but there's nothing to see. You can see it all, but there's nothing there. So all of a sudden, I'm standing in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of infinite space, and I could see myself looking down on my atrophied body in my green hospital gown, 
you know, I'm, I'm 174 pounds. I had gotten down to 138. My wife didn't even recognize me. I was a skeleton. And I could see myself in my bed with the new pulse, the heart pump, all the IVs, everything, the machine keeping me alive. But then I can also see myself standing in the middle of nowhere in the same green hospital gown, but I was whole, like I am now. And I'm standing there and it was almost as if I was connected to the universe all at once, connected to everything all at once. And I remember standing in that space, feeling like I was, I was made of sand and someone picked up the grains of my being and just threw me into a wind and scattered me across this infinite timeless universe. I became one with everything. And what's curious is, as being a Christian, I did not see God. I did not see Jesus Christ. Uh, instead, God was explained to me in kind of concepts that I wholly understood in that moment. It was placed upon my spirit, standing in the middle of nowhere, that I am the power behind all things. I am omnipotent. This is your identity. This is your reality. This is who you are. And as those concepts began to become pressed on my spirit, I thought to myself, wow, this is who I really am. My real identity comes from God. And I began to, the most fascinating part of the whole experience was, is that I began to see this incredible interactive web of twinkling lights that seem to hang on the ceiling of the universe. And the best way that I can explain this web that I both saw and became part of is that it looked like trillions and trillions of neurons. And we all know from science class what a neuron looks like. It, you know, there's a nucleus and then these tentacles, kind of like in the brain, and the, they're all woven together. And so it made this incredible, beautiful tapestry of twinkling lights that seemed to just stretch into infinity, which is what the cover of the book looks like, and it seemed to hang on the ceiling of the universe. And I realized while I was in that place that each little tiny spark of light or quark of light was a life. And that's how we were all connected. It was a message of unity and oneness. And as I became intertwined and part of this incredible, beautiful web that stretched into infinity, I realized in that moment that if I hurt myself, I hurt everything connected to me. But if I loved, the light would spread. And it was there that I realized that I am not my body. I'm not my race. I'm not my religion that I'm one with everything. And when I thought about, and, and it took me a while, particularly uh, after I, I came out of this and, and began to write about it. And when I thought about this web, it was curious to me that some parts of the web were brighter than others. Some parts were dark. And I didn't know what that was when I was in that place. And, and I'll get to that because I, I came to understand what that was later on. But the, the next thing that happened to me was, is that I began to see, as I'm standing there in the middle of nowhere, I began to see some of the nurses going in and out of patients' rooms that were taking care of me. And what was curious about that experience was, is that I only saw the nurses that I had made negative assumptions about. And it was a lesson in judgment. And it was something that, you know, we, we all say we don't do but we do. But it was curious because I began to see on, it was kind of like looking at movie trailers on multiple screens. I began to see their lives in a regression of events at high speed. And it was kind of like how a cartoon artist draws cartoons. You know, you draw each frame, each stage of that, each movement of that character, and then you flip it at high speed. And that's how, how cartoons were made. And that's what I was experiencing. I was watching their lives from who they were in that moment go back to childhood. And every time there was a, like a, a, a watershed event where that person was abused or they made bad personal choices or 
something you know dramatic had happened in their life, it was forming a picture for me of, of what that person had become and why they had become that way. And I remember thinking to myself, my God, how could I have ever judged these people so harshly? And then I saw a review of my own life and the things that I was most shameful of and the mistakes in my life. And I thought the same of myself. I thought, how could I have ever judged myself so harshly for what I have done? Because, you know, we all, we all understand now and we all have learned that we, we act on the information that we have at the time. You know, we're very complex beings and sometimes we don't, we don't act out our spiritual, we act out the temporal. And, you know, we, I've, I've come to understand we're spiritual beings having a human experience. In, in the book, I call that chapter spiritual beings, clay vessels. I know now that we're spiritual beings living inside these fragile clay vessels, only temporary. Um, so we're going to make mistakes. And it's important for us to learn from those mistakes and be held responsible for those mistakes. Don't get me wrong. But it was an incredible, incredible experience understanding that for the first time in my life. And I want to go back to those dark parts of the web because that's when it all clicked for me. And I knew that those dark parts of the web were places where human beings were not emanating and living out their purpose and being the loving spiritual beings from this place of from where, where we're from, which is God's irreproachable love and light. That's our real identity. And when we're not living out our purpose and when we're not spreading that love and light within, it seems as though in that spiritual web, you know, our light has a tendency to go a little bit dim. And I've come to understand that that web I saw in the spirit world is but a reflection of what we do here. What we do here matters. And because, you know, we're spiritual beings, but we're, we're living in this temporal world, but these two are connected. And when we do things that harm others here, and when we don't see us as all connected and one, and we make these mistakes, then it's a reflection. And this goes back and forth, back and forth as we learn these lessons and go through life. So th this, is, this was uh, uh, such an, an eye-opening experience for me that has made profound changes in my own life. But I have to tell you, Peggy, the most, uh, to me, the most fascinating part of this whole experience was when I saw my daughter and it's a, a very emotional thing for me to get through. But my daughter in this life, uh, she has a rare um, neurological disorder. Maria can't walk, talk, feed herself. And she's 25 years old now. She has a seizure disorder. And my wife and I have pretty much, you know, we've, we've sacrificed our lives to care for her. We've taken her all over North America to look for a cure. And in that place, I saw Maria. And she was perfect and whole. And I saw her standing in the middle of nowhere, staring at me. And this light was coming through her eyes. And it was a spiritual light, not the kind of light that we see in this life, but it was the, light, the spiritual life that animates all life, God's spiritual light. And Maria was standing there, whole and perfect, in the middle of nowhere. And when I saw her, uh, and I should say that. There, to me, my experience was that the five senses have no functionality in that place. I didn't smell anything, taste anything, hear anything. Communication in that place, my experience was that it was telepathic and synchronistic. It was almost like very much so when I was in that place, it became one with anything, with everything. If I, if I wanted to know the answer to anything, all I had to do was think about it. And the, the answer came. And the movie trailers yeah. too, they teach us. What was that? You call them movie trailers and I've called them then that, that too. There's visions that show up during our near death experience that teach us something. You saw, it, it, you call, call them movie trailers. Exactly, exactly. And I, you know, to, to me, um, when, I, when I tried to talk to Maria again, it wasn't a verbal thing. It was 
it was like the, the, the thoughts were felt and absorbed. A and you can, you can automatically know what someone is thinking just like that. Yeah. And when I said to Maria, Maria, you know, my whole life, all I want to do is hear your voice. I want to know your personality. I've never heard you say, I love you, daddy. I don't know what to do when you're suffering. My, my, you know, your mother and I don't know what to do when you're having seizures and we've tried everything. And Maria looked at me and she said, in that unspoken language of the ethereal, she looked at me and she said three words that changed my life. She said, just love me. Oh. And when she said, just love me, I found myself back in my hospital bed. It's beautiful. And that was the end of my experience. And I knew in that moment that it really didn't matter if a donor heart ever came because I was at total peace for the first time in my life. And I knew Maria would be okay. I knew that my wife would be okay, even though I wanted to stay to help them through this temporal world. But yet now I know for sure. And once you know the truth, there's no going back. So I knew that in this spiritual world, we're perfect, we're whole, we're loved, and that we're all part of God's universal love and light. And as I began to research uh, what those quarks were, I believe that God uses light to create heal and transform us. And when I began to, re to read what a quark was, so a quark is the smallest element, it's the smallest building block of matter. And there are different quarks. And these quarks combine, and they can make infinite possibilities in the universe. They can make a human being, a plant, a dog, a tree. And to me, I believe that that's what the creator uses. And these quarks are made of light, just like us. Everything animate and inanimate were all made of the same stuff. And when I was in that place, I realized that this is the only way the creator could have designed it. It's so simple, but we make it so difficult to understand. So God uses light to create. And that's why the title of the book is uh, Quarks of Light, A Near-Death Experience. So that's my, uh, that's my experience, Peggy. And then, uh, you know, interestingly enough, um, a few days later, uh, my donor heart arrived and I was transplanted successfully. Uh, and here I am um, almost six years later with no rejection, infection. And it's just, I could tell you the most amazing experience living with the essence of another human being inside you because I want to just touch base on that and talk about that for a second, because it's, it's something that I, I researched uh, a lot in the book and interviewed doctors for, and I just want to touch on it real quick because it's such a fascinating subject. Uh, most people don't know that the heart has a brain, which is the only reason why transplant works. Uh, so when you think about this and what my research exposed is that, of course, the first thing that develops in a mother's womb is the heart because the heart is what pumps blood through the fetus and starts developing the brain and the other parts of the body. So in the heart, there, there is a, a cluster of cells that actually begin to communicate with the brain and store our personal preferences, our emotions, uh, um, the foods that we like, the music that we like, and these two communicate. It's actually, people think that the brain communicates with the heart, but it's actually the reverse. The heart communicates with the brain first. So when you take out a birth heart, like they did with me, and you put in someone else's heart, that person comes with it to some degree. Now, it all depends on um, you know, how that person died, how open you are to experiencing the essence of that other human being inside you. Some people just close it out because they're afraid of it. But whether we like it or not, as transplants, that person expresses through us. Like for me, my wife laughs about it. You know, I had um, these wild cravings for food. 
that I've never had before because I've always been a bit of a health nut. Um, she, she, she claims that I drive in the middle of the road now <laughs> instead of on one side <laughs> or the other. She I must have been from to... Ohio. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I have these, these emotions that, um, that I have to fight against that aren't mine. Uh, sometimes emotions of despair, of depression, things like that, which I've never had before. So all of these interesting things uh, come with being a, a transplant recipient that, that I talk about in the book. But I could tell you that uh, what I've learned the most that, that has enriched my life is that we're all connected. We're all one. And when we realize that the only thing that is going to bring peace within ourselves and peace within our world is that exact concept. And if we really get it, that if we hurt ourselves, we hurt everything connected to us. I know it sounds Pollyanna, but when it really sinks in, like it has for me, you know, would there be war? Would there be reasons to kill one another, hurt ourselves, hurt one another? When we realize that we're all connected in that spiritual world and, and we all come from the same place, our identity comes from God. And I realized that how we allow the divine to express through us while we're here is all that matters. The rest is folly. Yeah. Uh, you know, and like you said, if people learn to stop judging so harshly, judging others so harshly, themselves so harshly. And it's hard thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's, a very, it's a very hard thing to do. Listen, we're human. We have our weaknesses. Um, and, and it's something that I still work on. I'm certainly not perfect. This experience hasn't made me perfect. It's opened my eyes to these possibilities. And it's opened, it's opened me up to uh, this incredible spiritual expanse. You know, there is a, uh, a chapter in the book entitled All One. And I did that chapter because I was so blessed with having doctors and nurses from every, every race, every world religion. I had everybody was, was, uh, was on my team trying to save my life. Everybody from, uh, from Christians to Sikhs to Muslims to Jews. I mean, it was just incredible. Uh, so what I did was in that chapter is that I explored all world religions and all belief systems and uh, I found out that there's this thread woven through all of them. And in their purest form, it's all about love because God is love. And, you know, as a Christian, I used to be very rigid in my thinking uh, about a belief in, in God and in, in Christ. But now I realize that everybody is on their own path. And as long as you're not doing harm and you're working toward that goal of understanding the oneness that, uh, that, that God has given us and that we will all have the same identity, as long as you're on that path, you know, who, again, who, who are we to judge how you get there? Um, and, 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 you know, the mysteries, the, the mysteries and, and the greatness of God are something that I could tell you I don't understand because God is just so big. Um, I believe in other universes, uh, other, other creations, uh, who are we to say we're the only ones? So God is just so omnipotent and magnificent that I think there's, uh, there's more than one way to get there. I just can't help but wonder if all of this sequence of events of uh, divine intervention didn't happen because your wife fell to her knees and prayed to God. You know, uh, I, I got to tell you that and this is something that uh, I still uh, grapple with. I think that God saved my life that night. Um, I, I thought, I think that I was meant to die. This was such a fluky thing. I was meant to tell my story. I think that it was, I see my daughter Maria as a spiritual being, just so pure and innocent. It taught me that children like my daughter who have no ulterior motives, have no hate, have no judgment, have no nothing. They're pure spiritual beings that God sends here so we can learn lessons from them. And 
I believe that between my wife falling to her knees and, and praying to God to save me and the lessons that Maria wanted to share with the world, because she's really the one that's the hero of the story and the catalyst for all this. I believe that God saved my life because he wanted me to come back and, you know, help Maria. Her story isn't over. Uh, the lessons, it was Maria. I dedicated the book to Maria because it was, it was God that spoke through me, uh, through Maria to me that convinced me that God exists because I went through a very, very bitter, I talk about it in the book, Peggy, actually I developed a hatred for God at one point in my life. Uh, I blame God for Maria's condition, blame God for everything. And it was, it was, it was God that spoke through Maria into my spirit on one cold, rainy February morning when I was cleansing her in the tub because she used to get impacted, giving her coffee enemas and cleansing her. And I just cried out to God, where are you? Where are you? And um, God spoke clearly into my spirit. And God said, look at me, I'm right here. And I looked at Maria and she had this incredible beautiful knowing smile on her face and this glow about her. And it was God speaking to me saying, here I am, you know, I'm, I'm right here living through her, living through you. You don't have to look any further. And it was the first time in my life, you know, I was raised Catholic and uh, I always use religion as kind of like an insurance policy. Hey, if I die, you know, I went to confession, <laughs> I'm a believer, but it, it was, I never really believed until that day. And so it was Maria that convinced me that God existed. And then when I died, I really believe it was the grace through Maria that God saved my life again and my wife and my wife uh, praying for sure. And for you to be able to hear Maria say to you, just love me. I mean, um, you and your wife might want to watch a little video I did. It's online. I think it's on my channel. It's called Memories of Dying. And I have three near death experiencers and the last one you should watch with your wife, his uh, daughter, Sasha um, died, she wasn't supposed to live past you know, very much after birth, she was disabled her whole life never communicate walk or you know, anything. And he died. And he saw her. And she was running and playing and said, Daddy, I love you. And the man weeps. You can just feel the love for his daughter, the grace was able to show him her in heaven. It's oh, so I, you know, I, I, I'm going to watch that. I so resonate with that because I, not only do I believe it, but I know, I know that I know it's the truth. So thank Kevin you for Dabbs, telling this me. Is I'm going to write it down. It's uh, called Memories of thing? Dying. And I have three near-death experiencers and he's the third one. And Kevin Dabbs is his name. I think it's like 30 minutes in or something. I'll watch that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate huh. that. Well, thank you for coming on. I know you not, got another interview to do, so I'll let you go. And thank you okay. so much for sharing your beautiful story and um, give your wife and your little girl my love. Because I know she'll always be your little girl. She's a very lucky yeah. girl. My dad never That's liked funny. me. You know, my mom don't like me. And so there's some of us that see how fortunate she is. She's so blessed to have parents to love her like that. Thank you. And thank you again for having me, Peggy. I really enjoyed it today. Thank you. Bye-bye.